eiköhän me taas aloitella pikkuhiljaa. Mä menen, kato, missä on niin, on niin ihan niin tuollaisessa valokeilassa. Eli tuota, mä olin Sirpa Kärkkänen Suomen metsäyhdistyksestä, unohdin edellisessä sessiossa aamulla esitellä itseni, mutta näinhän se usein käy. Ja tuota, nyt tänään tässä seminaarissa meidän teema on ulos, ja se on ulos fossiiliajasta kohti bioaikaa. Tällaisella teemalla lähdettiin liikenteeseen. Ja tässä on myös sitä teemaa, että meillä on paljon loistavaa tutkimusta esimerkiksi täällä Turussa ja, ja muissakin kaupungeissa. Ja, ja se ulos tarkoittaisi myös sitä, että lähdetään otta, lähdetään, otetaan kontaktia sieltä koulumaailmasta niin sinne tutkijamaailmaan ja hyödynnetään heidän tietotaitoaan ja asiantuntijuuttaan siinä koulutyössä. Ja tämä on sellainen seminaari, että ensimmäinen luento on englanniksi, mutta kaksi viimeistä on sitten suomeksi. Ja this is the reason why I now start speaking English. Because our first uh, lecturer uh, is from Norway, he is John Bean. And uh, the main idea, I think, uh, first I have to say that when you are building up future, you have to know the history what has happened and what kind of decisions we have made to come to this point. And I think Jun is going to tell us a light and a bit uh, that what kind of decisions, political and economical decisions was made when we decided to use oil and petroleum for energy instead of other uh, choices and other sources of energy. So the floor is yours, John. Thank you. Okay, the title I give in my lecture is The Nordic Transition to a post petroleum Economy. A few words about myself initially. My name is Jun Bingen. I have been working for too many years with the Norwegian energy policy and uh, international affairs, in particular global financial markets and security policy. And now I am working alone, have my own company in Fredrikstad, and we're going to talk about the Nordic post-petroleum economy. That is, I'm going to tell you about the, the big decisions, the processes which created the petroleum markets. Let's see if it's, something happens here. No, nothing happens. The petroleum markets in the 21st century have become the greatest markets there is in all volumes. We could compare it to the river uh, Amazonas. The river Amazonas is tremendous in space. It has lots of ramifications all over the southern American continent. And it is tremendous amounts of water which it sends out in the Atlantic Ocean each year, right? The same with the energy market, the petroleum markets. They're definitely the greatest in volumes, in produced petroleum, in financial sums, in streams of money, both for producing the petroleum as well as for uh, refinement, refinery and financial services, which is very important. But petroleum is not only a carrier of energy, it's also an important uh, ingredient in food, both for an animal as humans. It makes the world, that is 97 or 95 percent of chemical industry do now use petroleum as their principal raw material. Cloths, intelligent clothing, modern high fashion is very often based on natural gas and petroleum. And as you all know now, petroleum, the consumption of uh, fossil energy, natural gas and petroleum, is are the principal causes for changes in the climate system. That is, petroleum heats the world. And thus, in Paris, we finally reached an agreement to change this system within paradoxical or astonishingly short time, time frames. The world were supposed to change energy systems, we're supposed to change uh, uh, industry systems and go to bio-based petroleum uh, renewable substitutes. And these were motivated politically and in the treaties by the climate change mitigation. 
The problem or the positive thing is that even whatever conclusion you get on the climate issue, there are arguments that, okay, it might be human made, but in any case, it's not as simple as just reduce, for instance, the emissions of CO2. All those arguments can be as relevant as they might be. The point is, mankind, and in particular the states, have lots of other additional reasons to leave petroleum. That is, first of all, it's the fear of resource depletion. People from oil industry will tell you that. We have had the peak oil discussion since the 17th century, since the first petroleum industry were born in Germany and late after Napoleonic Wars in US and in Europe. There have always been the discussion of peak petroleum. The problem now is that there seems to be no disagreement on the fact that the petroleum reserves have peaked outside the Middle East. We do not find big new sediments of petroleum and natural gas outside the Middle East, which leads to an important aspect, motivation as well for the states. If you remain in the petroleum economy in the future, your dependence on the Middle East will increase as much. So if you do not want to be independent of a few states in the small area of the globe the rest of your life, so to say, you have to leave petroleum or at least reduce your dependence of petroleum. State finances. Most states have trade deficits and their trade deficits consist exactly of the imports of petroleum. Petroleum is very often, if not the only, but it's always an important component in all state trade deficits. What is even more, which will come later as well, if you want to buy petroleum, you need one peculiar currency, American dollars. So that your dependence of, impo of petroleum imports forces you to create an economy which is compatible and which generates by its exports American dollars so that you can import petroleum. If you want to change any of these aspects of the economy, if you want to reduce your trade deficits, if you want to reduce your independence of a small area of the earth, and if you want to have uh, uh, economic growth, you have to reduce your consumption of energy. And if the Paris agreements are successfully applied, then we will have different system of generation and storage of, the new, of renewable energy. And we will, within a few decades, see completely different energy markets. We will have completely different commodity markets. And we will have completely different financial markets, because those financial markets you get in an economy where the petroleum industry is not as dominating, you will have new monetary regimes, the new flows of trade, and you will have power hierarchies, global as well as regional, which are completely different from the petroleum industry or the petroleum economy. Am I pushing the wrong? Here we are. No, oh, too fast. Here we are. If we rapidly reduce our use of fossil energy, then we need to exchange or to change the renewable or the, f the energy carrier we use in the transport sector because the transport sector is very big and within the transport sector, petroleum has more than 90%. But this is highly possible and this is one of the paradoxes of the 20th century. It was started Petroleum was scarce in the early century. It was concentrated in very few areas of the earth, as it is still today. It was very expensive to develop and extract petroleum and transportation of petroleum from the production sites to the markets were expensive from the very beginning. But it has a competitor, and it had a, a competitor also at the, starting, at the starting point, and that was ethanol bio-based alcohols and the engineers inventing the internal explosion motion engine mo uh, the internal explosion engine 
they intended to make an engine which used alcohol as its energy carrier. And ethanol is abundant. It's anywhere, everywhere. It's made by the sun, easy to produce, it's clean, and it enhanced the value of the value chain or the value chains and the of, um, and employment in agriculture. This was a situation in approximately the change of the century from 1800 to 1900. And it was a tremendous competition, both in Europe as well as in US, between alcohol, ethanol, the green carbons, petroleum and coal, the black carbons, on the other hand. What happened and why? One more back. Then it disappeared, all of it. <laughs> One more. Do number four. There we are. This is publicity from Berlin. 1902 or 1900. If you read German, you see the point. It is, uh, he is selling an engine, Spiritus Lucumobil, that is, he is selling engines which are running on alcohol. And if you make the right contacts, you get uh, further information about this engine. We don't need that, but in any case, why ethanol eneth lost is one of history's most greatest paradoxes. Of course, in the oil industry, we always say that it's due to the energy content in the substances. That is, 30% less energy per unit of alcohol as compared to petroleum. But that can't be alone, the explanation, because alcohol, as I said earlier, can be produced anywhere, everywhere by the sunshine. Petroleum and coal, you have to have lots of big excavations capital intensive outfits, it's ex very extremely. In any case, ethanol lost. And here is the explanation. War. War, war, and once again, war. Theodore Roosevelt, the American president at the change of last century, sent the big white fleet. It was uh, na the US Navy circumvented the world just to demonstrate that U.S. is now a big power. It went on coal, and the admiral, I forgot his name, reported to uh, the president that our ships go very well, our guns fire excellently. The problem is, each time we need reinforcement of energy, that is coal, we have to ask the British Navy. So, we have a big army, we have a big U.S. Navy, it is completely dependent on British supplies outside the American waters. That was a paradox which the American president did not appreciate. And he said, OK, let's move from coal, one energy carrier, to another which the British do not have, which is that petroleum. And that was the introduction of the constant factor in the global energy petroleum markets, that is, the big state monopsonies, the big state purchases of petroleum, the armed forces. There were sufficient petroleum reserves in the US at the time, <coughs> so the US decided this transition in 1905. Royal Navy understood the situation. They saw that the American fleet was disappearing, running away from there, global logistics for Navy supplies of coal and made the same decision in 1912 after furious decision decisions in the uh, British Admiralty. Why should we do that? The British Naval officers said, we have no oil on the British Isles. Well, you had an old, very young, promising Naval Minister or Chief Naval Minister called Winston Churchill. He said, the oil we don't have in the Great Britain or on the British Isles we'll get elsewhere. And this is the beginning of British Empire's focus on the Persian Gulf. Because the Persian Gulf is where you found the oil. So since 1912, global sea power implied global rivalry for oil. 
And here comes the devil's combination. If you have lots of petroleum in the region, the weak states, you risk of having perpetual war, as you've had in the Arab world since 1918. Perpetual war since 1918. Please, we go further. Here you see the magnitudes of the markets by 2016 or 15. Approximately 96 billion a day is produced by petroleum, or 35 billion barrels per year. And the biggest buyer all over the world is not cars, but states. And states buy whatever weather there might be outside. States buy petroleum even when it's war. They increase their consumption of petroleum during a war. So, in the world market, in the world economy, in the entire world economy, there is no commodity with such market conditions as petroleum. <coughs> we go to the next. But what is as in interesting and as important if you want to change the petroleum economy? The entire chain of value within the petroleum economy consists of intimately connected cartels. In the middle, you have major banks. All the big Anglo-American banks, from uh, Citigroup to, in particular, JP Morgan. All the big banks in New York and London are the general staffs and the financial provider, or the providers of financial services to the oil industry. They finance operations, they give you credit to start digging, exploring, and excavation, and so forth. But what's as important at the end of the process, the sovereign funds, like the Norwegian State Sovereign Fund, all of them end up in those banks. They start by loaning, and they stop by administrating the funds generated by the industry. Second, <coughs> you have the International Oil Companies, IOCs. They were born 150 to 100 years ago. For instance, Shell, British Petroleum, and all these companies. They have the technology. They have the technology. Then you have national oil companies, like Statoil in Norway, uh, Aramco in Saudi Arabia, and so forth. They control reserves. But IOCs, the international oil companies, they had technology, and I had forgot to tell you, they also controlled access to markets. So that you might as have as much oil as God ever gave you as a national oil company. But if you don't have the extraction technology, and if you don't have access to the markets in the OECD, you can't use it for any, more, any purpose, right? So they are in reality closely interconnected. And in the middle, the middleman is, of course, uh, the banks. The OPEC was established in the 1960s, formally as well as politically in a very confrontational attitude toward the consuming countries. But one thing which has never been focused in the global media was that it has been an alliance between the United States of America and the Saudi Arabians since 1944. And this was confirmed now recently by Donald Trump being in the Middle East. It was initiated by Delano Roosevelt during the Second World War, and there it was renegotiated in 1974 when the dollar was taken off gold in 1972 and put so-called on petroleum in 1974. So the biggest and most important member in OPEC, financially, industrial, and technologically speaking, is the United States of America. The United States of America. And then you have not OPEC countries like Norway, Russia, and so forth. But of course, Russia is very big. But it's, and it also has become a very big uh, exporter. But compared to the alliance between Saudi Arabia, OPEC, and US, they do not interfere in the markets to a big extent. And the Soviet Union, 
This is also very important to understand how things worked during the Cold War. The Soviet Union had a kind of a monetary union based on petroleum on the United States of America. That is, the Russians or the Soviets started to export and sell their petroleum in 1946 in dollars. The Russians created the euro dollar market in 1947 by the petroleum exports. So they have all the Soviet Union was a communist state within the American petrodollar economy. And this is maybe the biggest riddle of them all. Because we have since 1974 seen ups and downs in a global petroleum price driven inflation. What is an inflation? If you read today's newspaper, you get the impression that inflation is any increase of prices, but that is not true. Because in inflation, all prices increase at the same time, everywhere. Right? So it's either the money which is changing, or there's something very similar to money which changes. And if the petroleum prices change, all other prices in which petroleum goes in as an energy or an industrial raw material changes as well. So petroleum is the only commodity in the world which has an inflationary potential. And this inflationary potential has been used since 1974, both by the big exporters and producers, as well as by US and the US dollar and the US international banks. They have created a mechanism which made it possible for the Americans to tax the global economy by inflation driven by petroleum prices. This ended in 2007, 2008, and in the meantime, we had a kind of a central bank inflation, but that's not so important. The thing for the bioeconomy is, next picture. Okay, <coughs> this petroleum driven inflation taxation was a tremendous discussion in Europe in the 20s and in the 30s. Because, as I told you, the armed forces were going from horses to petroleum, and lucid people all over Europe saw that this is dangerous. Because if the armed forces are using an energy carrier, which we do not have, just a few have, they both can, they have a tactic and military superiority and a financial superiority. So, for instance, French economists like Jacques Reff was advisor to de Gaulle, all warned, aye, aye, we might have a global taxation mechanism at hand unless we manage to do something together against it. And this was in the 20s already, the beginning of the idea of a European monetary system. Uh, between um, the German Chancellor and the French Prime Minister, I don't remember the names for the time being. In the 30s, Italy and Germany became pioneers of automobile industry, highway systems, and the production of ethanol, competitor to petroleum. After the Second World War, French and Italian energy ambitions, the Gaspari, Christian Democratic Italian Politico, Politico and Enrico Mattei, who created Eni, the Italian oil company, his ambition was to have an independent oil industry and a Middle East independent Italian Middle East diplomacy to avoid inflation taxation over the petroleum markets. The same did the goal have, but he said we want to go for the nuclear power. The European Union bioeconomy, that strategy has its roots all the way down to the 1920s, always motivated by avoiding taxation by petroleum markets. In a bioeconomy, you have no possible cartels for raw material because biomass is everywhere. You get more real markets because there are no monopolies and no cartels. But should this be financed, we have to solve today's petroleum-based debt crisis. And we have to siphon out the pressure in the Western European housing bubble. Because these are all consequences by the petroleum-driven inflationary economies. 
But if we have success to do that, then we will have enhanced growth and we could initiate investment growth and value creation almost everywhere. This is a tremendous ch challenge, of course. But the Nordic countries, I would say, by and for themselves, are too small to create big markets, big energy systems, and also to have the necessary financial muscles to do this. But we have very interesting raw materials, both of biomass on land as well as biomass from marine environments. We also have together the financial means. And not the least, the Nordic countries do have the scientific competence, we have the technological competence, and at least in embryo, the industrial production lines which make such a decision possible, even within a quite short time frame. So, I believe that enhanced Nordic cooperation in general is in need, and not the least regarding the transition from petroleum to biomass-based energy systems and industrial systems. And I do believe that Nordic bioeconomies is the only investment-driven way out of the perpetual slump of today. Thank you very much. Questions, of course, sorry. <laughs> Comments, questions? <laughs> no, okay. Um, yeah, so it, it, it seems to me that you are, like the uh, general attention seems to be on a, on a change of kind of replacing the fossil fuels with something else. So, um, Looking at, at the kind of reality of the problem, I think the problem is not that the fuels we are using currently are fossil. The, the main problem we have is our status quo that is, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. supporting the use of these kind of fuels. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and this status quo is so deep rooted that, like, you know, I don't even know if I'm, you know, if, if you divide people in, in us and them, you know, the, the mm -hmm. bad people who, mm -hmm. I don't know, drill in the Arctic mm -hmm. and we the good mm -hmm. people who know better. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I don't know, uh, you know, use recyclable whatevers. Mm -hmm. um, like, I, I think it's not so easy, you know, like when you, when you buy a paprika wrapped, wrapped in plastic, you're one of us who is drilling in the Arctic mm -hmm. or, or, or using fossil fuel. So it's like really difficult. And, and I think this, this status quo that we are, you know, running, we fuel it with fossil fuels in the moment. So. I think the, the change that we need is not looking at what alternative fuels we have. I think the change we need is how do we change our status quo. And, and that is like a lot easier than I think we think because it's, it's just taking away the value away from the oil. Mm -hmm. So if, if, not, if we don't value oil anymore, if we just stop using it and not like, I, I think the P Paris Climate Agreement is like, you know, very ambitious, but by far not there what, what, what mm -hmm. would be possible. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's all direct <coughs> legislations and not at the, um, you know, private people who, who have the power to, you know, just say no, like, d just don't use, just don't use it because we don't need it. We, we're civil still Civil disobedience, naked. you say, kind of commercial civil disobedience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, like targeting the consumer and ourselves, mm -hmm. like, you know, mm -hmm. making the separation, like taking away the separation between us and them because it's just us people uh, and, and we are the problem. Uh, and the solution, I think, so. I agree in that. Mm -hmm. The problem is that absolutely everything, even the box you have in your hands, maybe consists of, I guess, 40% well, petroleum. I, I think I can do without. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I think we need a very conscious and elaborate and robust strategy to be able to reduce our dependence on petroleum. Unless uh, you see some technological breakthroughs, which I don't see, but in any case, uh, it is, of course, very much dependent on the price of petroleum. But I think it's impossible for the big producers and exporters in the Middle East, as well as US, to have prices as low as making bio-based alternatives irrelevant. I don't think that's possible. So I think a green carbon industry could compete today with petroleum. For instance, uh, in Norway, if we have to export our oil and gas at contemporary prices, 
Norway would be in a very serious economic crisis within a few years. Yeah, but, but that's, that's uh, in, 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 in a world where we value a GDP yeah, 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 uh, and not yeah. happiness. Well, yes, but yeah. in any case, we just see the fragility of the situation. So, and unfortunately for us, this is very positive because it's, possi it's possible to leave uh, the, the petroleum markets and we can use the petroleum for much more prudent products than transportation. And we can use the fossil CO2 in petroleum to create industries instead of uh, re-emerging it down in the crust as we intend to do if we capture and if we want storage of CO2. There are other ways to use petroleum than, petrol than transportation and these other ways should be introduced into the Scandinavian economy as soon as, and Russian economy as well because we can't compete with Saudi Arabian and uh, South American petroleum production. That's impossible. And Chinese, I would say, because the Chinese have no other currency than the dollar. So, yes. Ilmastosopimuksissa, niin saattaa olla jotain tämän tyyppistä. 